All right. It is 11 o'clock um, <laughs> on the dot. <clears throat> we may still have people joining us um, as I introduce everybody. And um, we're going to, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming to this meeting briefing for the investigation of microphysics and precipitation for Atlantic coast threatening storms, which we all call impacts because it's much less of a mouthful. So this is a field campaign, an airborne field campaign that NASA is running this winter. I'm your moderator. My name is Ellen Gray. I'm with the NASA's Office of Communications. Um, the briefing will be taking place in two parts. First, we'll have our panelists speak. Um, and then at the when those are all finished, we will open up the floor for a question and answer session. We will be taking questions both from raised hands. Um, we will unmute you and you can ask your question out loud. And um, we also take questions from the chat box, which um, Alana Johnson, my colleague, will read verbatim. We will also be taking a few questions that have come in across social media. Um, and so we'll be reading those as well. Um, we do have a resources page uh, for additional photos and, um, and B-roll video. We're having a little bit of a technical difficulty getting that live, but we will probably have it by the question and answer session. So I'll share the link with that when that is live. All right. And then I think with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Lynn McMurdy. She's a research associate professor at the University of Washington, and she is IMPACTS's uh, principal investigator. Uh, give me a moment here and I'll share my screen. You can see it okay. Let me see if I can find my cursor in just a second. All right, everything is, looks good. Um, all right, so uh, as um, Ellen said, this is Impacts, and I would like to acknowledge my um, deputy PIs, Jerry Himesfield, John Yorks, and Scott Brown, all from NASA Goddard, and the entire Impacts team, which are too numerous to, uh, to name here, but they've been uh, real stars. Uh, as you know, uh, snowstorms are really important things to uh, forecast well. They have huge in, uh, social impacts uh, with uh, closed roads, uh, closed schools, um, and, and canceled flights. And these are headlines that uh, we took just from a couple weeks ago with a big um, nor'easter type storm that uh, affected the region here. And we actually did a sample with our, our instrumentation. I thought I'd just do a little background to give you an idea of what a snowstorm looks like. It's uh, when you look at the clouds from them, the clouds uh, that associated with a snowstorm can stretch huge geographical regions from, you know, here we are from South Carolina, way past well up into Canada. And, um, but what's interesting is that the snowfall within these clouds is not evenly distributed. It's not like everywhere it's snowing the same. It's snowing in actually um, banded regions, like what I show here on the right, uh, these little um, stripes of yellow or enhanced reflex activity on a radar and each one of these as they came over um, <clears throat> the coast of uh, uh, you know near Boston uh, each was an enhanced time of, um, of snowfall and that made uh, this particular region uh, right at, uh, south of Boston have the most snowfall from our storm a couple weeks ago and it was due to these snow bands. So that is what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to understand the mechanisms and the processes that create these bands and why some storms have them and other storms do not. And, uh, and, the, pro and the processes happen on multi scales, both with the large scale uh, dynamics, as we call that. The thermodynamics is how the temperature and the wind interact to make the snow. And then down to the scale of the snow crystals themselves, these little tiny pictures here it's called the microphysics, the actual snow crystals in the clouds. So we're trying to characterize, understand our uh, the, those processes, and then apply this understanding to improving remote sensing of snowfall from spaceborne instruments, and to apply this understanding to how we can improve modeling snowfall in storms, so we can improve how we can warn uh, people where and when the snowfall will occur. 
So how are we doing this? We are primarily doing this with two aircraft. And after I speak uh, soon, you'll hear from two pilots, one from each aircraft. Uh, the first one on the top here is the ER-2. It flies well above the storm systems themselves. And um, it has remote sensing type instrumentation on it, radars and passive microwave instruments, just like what we have in a satellite. But with the aircraft, we can guide where we want it to go. We can take it right over the storm over and over again. And underneath it, the P3 aircraft, it's equipped with instrumentation that uh, measures the actual snow crystals and all the properties of the clouds and environment in which those, those clouds, those snow bands form. On the ground, we have a couple of um, um, radars also, but they are anchored to certain locations. And But a couple of them are on trucks that we can tell them to go to Plymouth, uh, Massachusetts, or go to Elmira, New York, and uh, make measurements there in coordination with our, our flights. And we have also teams of people who uh, send off balloons uh, to make environmental profiles of, of temperature, wind, and humidity. And pressure. Um, so the rest of the time, I'm just going to show you some pictures, and you'll get to see these two aircraft live. But on the left here is the P3, uh, right before one of our flights. Beautiful sunrise picture. And in the middle, uh, with the red arrows, these are actually the instruments that are uh, uh, pictures of a couple of the instruments that are on the aircraft. They're they're mounted to below the wings. It's a little bit outside this picture, not where the props are, but to the edges there. And there's also some other instruments on P3. But this is what microphysics probes looks like, these very fancy things. And then the other aircraft here is the ER-2, when you'll get to see that live uh, when you uh, talk to the pilot. And um, I actually took a picture when they were working on instrumentation. Uh, the instruments are hiding in the nose here. Here the nose is open so you can see inside. Uh, or they're hiding on, in these uh, bomb, I don't know what they call them, bomb, these, these pods on the, on the wings and even underneath the aircraft here. So you'll hear more about that from, uh, from our pilot. Here's a view from one of our uh, flights. I think a couple of these pictures are from that snowstorm that occurred on the 29th of January. And another is when um, we actually don't wanna see the ground, we wanna see clouds, but we've got a little bit out of the cloud here. Um, and this is what it looks like when our the part of our science team are, are doing the ground obser uh, observations. Uh, we did, here's the mobile truck that is a radar on it, and it was stationed at Plymouth, Massachusetts on the 29th. Uh, the tide came in and almost flooded the truck, only got it thankfully up to the wheels, uh, but it operated throughout that storm. It got really excellent data. Uh, another truck uh, from that is from uh, Stony Brook University. Uh, this is the radar they have on their truck, and they were, for a different case, they went up to Elmira. And all these other pictures of what it's like to launch weather balloons in a snowstorm. You can see it can be pretty hard to see, but we still, in the name of science, these, um, these are all students actually who are doing the launches. Uh, they got great data for us. Um, and just for fun, I actually am showing you true science results here. Uh, the color pictures are from the ER2 looking down. This is what the radar reflectivity looks like at different wavelengths. And we do that to see this one is sensitive to cloud tops and very, very fine particles. And the one on the bottom only sees the bigger particles. But you can see that you can see how uneven and how much structure is inside these clouds. And then these are pictures uh, from uh, cloud probes of what we were seeing inside the clouds. And you can see the variability of what these crystals look like. This one is actually a hexagon, like our impacts uh, um, uh, logo here, but the little dots on it are from super cooled water that froze right onto the crystal. Uh, beautiful dendrite. And we call these um, uh, capped columns or tie fighters for fun. Uh, just a little flavor of the kinds of um, uh, measurements we're making and we're trying to put this together to understand why the snow forms in these banded structures, what does it look like in there, how to interpret our radar, and then eventually how to make the measurements from space better and eventually how to make our, our models better. And I just have a picture of our science team here all wearing masks because it was this last uh, September we managed to meet in person with COVID protocols, but um, uh, got great science done. So thank you, Ellen. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, once you stop sharing your screen, please remember to mute.
Um, next, we are going to North Carolina and the ER2. Um, the pilot uh, that is <laughs> going to be speaking with you is Greg Coach Nelson um, from Armstrong Flight Research Center in Edwards, California. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah, my name is Greg, uh, call sign Coach Nelson. I am an ER2 uh, research pilot with NASA. I've been flying with NASA for about seven years. Uh, real quick, a little bit about me, just so you know who this guy is that's talking to you. Um, like, So I, I do fly the ER2 with NASA. Prior to NASA, I was a Lockheed Martin uh, test pilot. And prior to that, I was a US Air Force U2 pilot. So I am well qualified to fly this airplane. Been doing it for about 30 years. Um, the airplane itself, I'll talk about that real quick. The, uh, the U-2 that the U.S. Air Force flies and that what I was doing with uh, Lockheed is the uh, parent airplane of this ER-2 behind me. That, that's there's, It's a high altitude reconnaissance aircraft. Uh, NASA has two of them and they've modified them for various roles for uh, NASA missions and they call that the ER-2. Um, it, this particular aircraft on this uh, mission out here is outfitted with it's just bristling with sensors, actually, in my opinion. It's got them all over the jet. It's pretty impressive. And as Ellen mentioned, the all these sensors do remote sensing, so we can emulate what a satellite might be seeing, and then we can keep it over the area of interest for uh, many hours with multiple passes if necessary. And uh, that's kind of our mission out here, is that remote sensing piece of it. Uh, the ER-2 can fly Above 70,000 feet, we try to keep it in the 65,000 range, and uh, we do that all day long. Now, some of the unique things about flying this airplane is because we're so high altitude, we have to wear a full pressure suit, which is like a, uh, it's actually the same spacesuit that NASA shuttle astronauts were wearing when they flew the shuttle. So you imagine that's what you're wearing all day long when you fly this aircraft, and, uh, and that brings up some uh, interesting operational aspects. And I think the best way to cover that is just, uh, I'll just walk you through how we fly a mission with this jet. So it kind of starts the day prior. It could actually start it even before that. But for me, it pretty much starts the day prior when I, I get the mission plan from our mission planners and I start going over that and he, he briefs me on what, what they're uh, wanting to do and what they want to cover. I need to understand all the objectives so that I can uh, fly the mission more accurately. And, uh, then we go into crew rest. We come in the next morning to fly the mission. We show up about three hours prior to takeoff time. And everything we do is highly choreographed on that takeoff time. So we show up three hours prior. We go into a briefing. Um, we cover the weather, both the weather for the mission and the weather that's going to affect the aircraft as far as uh, safely launching and recovering it. And we, we look at all the normal stuff that a pilot would look at. And then uh, about an hour and a half prior to takeoff time, the, there's another U-2 pilot we call Mobile, and we always team up as a pair. We, we trade off the missions. One guy drives the car one day, one guy flies the airplane. So we'll, uh, the guy who's flying the airplane goes to pilot equipment and gets suited up, integrated into the pressure suit, which takes about uh, 15, 20 minutes. And the other pilot will head out to the airplane, driving the car that's behind me, and he'll start setting up the aircraft and getting it already. Um, by one hour prior to takeoff time, I'm now fully integrated in the pressure suit and sealed up and breathing 100% oxygen, which is important to denitrogenize your blood, get the nitrogen out of your blood, and that cuts down on the risk of the bends. Um, about an hour, I'm sorry, about uh, 45 minutes prior to takeoff time, they'll drive me out to the aircraft. By then, the uh, mobile pilot has it all prepared and ready to go, and they'll strap me into the jet. I'm so en encumbered by the pressure suit, I can't even strap myself in. So they, the, the technicians do it all for you. You just put your hands up and you get strapped in. And then they plug you into the intercom and then you can start talking to the outside world and you feel like a pilot again because now you're in control of your, your life a little bit. Um, engine starts about 30 minutes prior. We run through all the systems on the jet. We run through some checks with the instrumentation. And by about 10 minutes prior to, tack, to uh, take off, we're taxiing. By five minutes prior, we're out at the end of the runway requesting takeoff clearance. We uh, get on the runway, they pull the final pins, and the best part of the whole mission is pushing that power up and blasting off the runway, and it does blast off. It climbs, uh, initial climbs uh, 10 to 15,000 feet a minute. We, we're hitting 20,000 feet, just 
90 seconds after takeoff and, and then it starts to slow down and climb like a normal airplane. And, but we're typically at operational altitude within 30 minutes, which is pretty nice. Up, up at altitude, we cruise uh, about the same speed as an airliner, but uh, our operational envelope, of course, is shrunk down. So, so we have uh, issues, not, not so much with this jet because we're flying it at 65,000. If we were to try to fly it at maximum altitude like the U-2s did, we, we also advertised that we had like a 15 knot operational window. We're a little bit safer because we're a little bit lower on these ERG missions, but it's still up there where we're having to deal with maximum mock, so you can't go too fast. And if you try to slow down, then you start to stall. So your, your envelope is shrinking as you get up there. The, the missions are pretty busy where we're, there's not a lot of time for sightseeing. We're, we're uh, contacting, first of all, they're very choreographed. We, the P3 pilot will, will speak to this as well. We're both uh, coordinating our flight routes and we have a uh, pilot, a team member on the ground who helps us coordinate our uh, routes and uh, He'll, he'll radio them up or, or call us on our uh, Iridium satellite phone and uh, give us the routes, the detailed routes that we're going to fly. And the, and the P3 pilot and the ER2 pilot will coordinate these routes and, and we try to get over the same area of interest at the same time so that they can collect the, the data that they need, the scientists are looking for. Um, and that goes on for uh, many hours and... Uh, like I say, not a lot of time for sightseeing, but every once in a while, when it gets slow in the mission, I will look out the window <laughs> and uh, and it just blows you away. I mean, the view is amazing sometimes. And so we're above about 95% of the atmosphere and and that creates a scene that uh, you're, we're right at, just skimming the top of the atmosphere. We, the, we can't see stars, but we can definitely see curvature of the earth. And uh, the sky is starting to, to turn a dark purple and it, you, you get the sense if I went higher, I, I would I could see stars, but you can't quite see them. And yet, even though it's getting darker, it's extremely bright because there's nothing blocking that sun. It's just coming in at full strength. Um, and then you can see about 120 miles in any direction. So you, you're, you, you can encompass 240 miles looking left and then right again, which is kind of cool because sometimes it looks like you're looking at a map from up there. And... When it's time to come home, we come back, and that's where the mobile pilot with the car comes in again. He's been uh, monitoring the airfield, keeping everything safe for your uh, return. If there's any kind of emergency, he's your first point of contact. He can help you read checklists and things of that nature. So that, that uh, mobile pilot will then chase you to landing uh, with the car, and he'll uh, actually talk you down from about 10 feet down to touchdown. He'll give you the, the altitude calls you need to get the aircraft safely back on the ground again. And... Uh, I'll open it back up to any questions or back to Elena. We'll hold the questions till the Q and A session, but thank you, coach. That was <clears throat> really, it's always wonderful to hear like the process that these field campaigns need to go through in the logistics. Next up, um, we're going to Rodney Turback, who's our NASA P3 pilot out of Wallet's flight facility on Wallet's Island, Virginia. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Rod Turback, uh, white coach. Uh, I was in the military previously, uh, flew multiple different aircraft, but uh, the one that uh, we're emphasizing today is the P-3, and that's how I started off uh, my career, flying the P-3, uh, originally in an anti-submarine warfare type of uh, role. Uh, this is obviously considerably different. Uh, it's for science and outfitted completely differently than the, uh, the, the aircraft that we flew in the military. Um, one of the things that uh, are quite different and then what Coach Neer too is, same thing, we come in, uh, do the pre-flight, we come in about a couple of hours earlier as opposed to three uh, and work the coordination. The big difference with him is, uh, of course, he's wearing a spacesuit. We aren't. Uh, we are uh, carrying all the uh, science with us, uh, a lot of it, and the scientists, many of the same similar types of instrumentation, but what we're looking for is to try and get what's actually in mm -hmm the cloud, or as they will say in situ. Uh, we fly with an air crew of about six, uh, so I have a heck of a lot more help uh, than he does to uh, get the aircraft in the place that it needs to be. Uh, but it, in some senses, it takes sometimes more coordination as well as we're traversing across the country, uh, many eight uh, different air traffic control regions, uh, as well as uh, we're in the weather, so therefore we're uh, having to 
use the anti-ice, de-ice systems and all the different capabilities of the aircraft to uh, keep all of the science scientists and the passengers in that sense uh, safe, uh, but uh, to, to still get the science. So about, uh, like him, about 45 minutes prior, we, we meet, we do a full plane side brief, go through uh, just, just the, uh, the mission and the different potential scenarios that could possibly happen. About 15 minutes later, uh, we're taxiing off for takeoff, going to meet the time. Same thing, uh, not going near as high as he is. Uh, usually we're, we have the ability to go a little higher, but usually we're running uh, maybe as high as 25,000 feet, but then we'll work our way down to as low as three or 4,000 feet, depending on whether we're over land or over water, uh, trying to uh, capture the other pieces of, of science. Uh, one thing that's a little nicer, we have a little more flexibility than he does with room to, to move. So uh, we can uh, get, get some coffee and some food every now and then to uh, take a little break, uh, which, which, which makes it a little easier, but uh, uh, and a little more fun sometimes, I suppose. But uh, we also don't have the beautiful views he has. Uh, when we're in there, we're pretty much seeing a cloud of white, uh, you know, depending on whether we're in a snow cloud above it, below it, uh, or in it. So definitely a little bit different. Uh, like you said, considerably long hours of flight time in that uh, and, uh, and working the coordination uh, as, the, as the weather moves with the science and where they want the airplanes to be. And, uh, and then one of the things that uh, I don't know if you mentioned or not, but we're, we've been able to have pretty good communications between the two of us uh, in, uh, in the airplane. So although we're both talking to ground and getting coordination there, uh, we're also talking to air traffic control to deconflict with the uh, other aircraft in the area. The good thing is uh, most people don't want to be flying in this. As I, as I said in an interview one time before, you know, I spent 26 years of my life trying to avoid what science wants us to go into today. Uh, so it, it, it is good in the sense that uh, most pilots and uh, the airline industry is trying to avoid the stuff we're flying. So in, in one sense, as much as we thought the coordination would be difficult, quite often it's, uh, it's, it's actually somewhat easier uh, because we're going where they're trying to avoid and, uh, for, the, for those reasons. But uh, other than that, then we uh, come back to uh, Wallops here, a uh, flight facility where we're out of right now, and uh, debrief with them. and go over all the different aspects of what was good, what was bad, what they got, what they didn't get, and what we can do to uh, provide a better platform for them in the future and, uh, and bring all of them back safe. Thanks, it's always, it's always fun to hear. All right, um, our last speaker is Will McCarty. He is the program scientist for impacts at uh, the Earth Science Division at the agency's headquarters in Washington. So he's going to be sharing his slide. Let me adjust this. Um, is that full screen? Hope so. All right. Well, hopefully I will be able to get this back to full screen in one second. Um, will, why don't you go ahead? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, my name is Will McCarty. Uh, I'm the pro uh, program scientist at headquarters for IMPACTS. Uh, I work in the weather and atmospheric dynamics focus area. Um, and again, that's under the Earth Science Division. So to to give an understand understanding of of the agency perspective is is why does NASA care about snow? Um, you know the the uh, Dr. McMurdy already talked about the scientific objectives of impacts, but but there's really this is part of a longer, a larger understanding of the Earth system. The, and really, Earth sciences at NASA aims to basically characterize, understand, and predict the Earth system, um, as well as share share our knowledge and our apply our knowledge to to real world cases. And and we do this by linking uh, science and technology, linking space and airports observing obser observing systems, and also really linking to what the national needs are. So to understand the Earth system, the Earth system is a rather complicated thing, and, and it's really um, going beyond our original um, goals. You know, where where really the understanding the Earth system, you know, really dates back to weather prediction. But we're really, especially in the world of climate change, and understanding the Earth system more as a, a global interconnected system. So this this is just a cartoon graphic that kind of shows where you know these observations can really fit in. You know, they 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 relate to the water cycle. They relate to um, you know the, how uh, the very you know various ecosystems that live off of these storms and really you know get a, a large part of their their winter water source from that. Although it's it's on the east coast, it drains out to sea a lot. 
Um, but you know, it's, all these things kind of intertie. But really, what's key to this is, is really that center point on that figure, which is um, to understand how you know basically all of these things impact human human understanding and human contributions and human responses. Um, and so these things really tie into to that. That's kind of the the overarching is that we're really NASA Earth Science is really trying to understand the Earth as a giant interconnected system, and and we do that through a number of different areas. So this is kind of the side to side end to end reason of, of why we do these these missions. Um, you know, this this is fundamentally a scientific research mission, um, and and that you know that really is is part of our research and analysis. But but at NASA, science drives um, our capability. So technology development, which we fund, you know, really down to the, the microchip level, uh, and, and is is you know really developed with the goal of getting to flight missions and, and and science activities that can then basically help us do fundamental or science research. But that fundamental or science research then goes on to produce a ton of data. Um, it's and, and then those the, that data that research can hopefully then. Uh, go to earth system application. So really apply to real world things um, that that affect the everyday person. And, and to think that this chart flows left to right, absolutely not. Um, you know, the it really flows both ways where, where you know, um, but at the, the fundamental goal of this is, is the understanding of the earth system and figuring out how that, um, you know, basically can can link from everything from how do we mo measure it to how do those measurements affect people at the very end and everything in between. So this is kind of the, that was the, the end to end. This is the top to the bottom. So um, we'll actually work from the bottom up, but uh, the idea here is, is really understanding the observations. And, and Lynn kind of talked to this as well, but you know, the idea is, is that we're, we're at the microscopic level really with, with the snow crystals and the variability on those um, and understand, and those help us understand, you know, the scientific objectives of the, the snow banding events and East Coast snowstorms, which obviously play, play a large impact onto a lot of people. Um, but, you know, obviously we can't look at the microscopic really much further than the airplane you're flying through. So we fly airplanes, we fly airplanes through the storms and, and above the storms as mentioned, and you can really see these, these small scale features on a, a, a larger scale, you know, tick to tick here, we're, we're talking about about 10 miles, I think, um, tick to tick. And um, what you see is these small scale features that really, um, when we can observe them both at the smaller levels and then these levels, um, you know, the, understanding the different scales and how they interact and how you can basically estimate smaller scales that you can observe with, with more coarse observations really help you define that fundamental understanding. Because that, you know, uh, when we're in, in an aircraft, we get some, some nice features, but then you go to space and what you don't have, and let's face it, we're a space agency, you don't necessarily get the, those fine scale features from space because you're flying at, you know, roughly, you know, 700 kilometers or 400 kilometers versus, um, you know, 20, 30, 40 kilometers. So, you know, there's a fundamental difference of what you can observe just by the fact that you're so much higher. But what you do get from space is the global picture. So uh, what we do is we really look at all these different scales to get the global picture because we're really trying to understand the Earth system as a whole and then use these airborne missions to both complement in both directions, the satellite observations as well as understand how we make those linkages from literally the microscopic scale up to the larger scale. And what that really, what that ultimate improved understanding gives us is, is effectively better understanding of the physics that go into our models. This is actually a model picture. It kind of looks like a satellite picture, um, but this is from the, the GEOS model out of NASA Goddard. And, and what we really understand, this helps in these models, these models are, every numerical model has has to have assumptions to understand, under to, to represent the scales that you can't represent in these models. And this really shows that, you know, we're getting this end-to-end -end observation from a four-dimensional global depiction of the, the Earth system through these models all the way down to the microscopic observations. And, and what we're really trying to do is, is better understand the system as a whole. And of course, this is an atmospheric uh, prediction right here, but but even the the models themselves are moving from you know atmospheric or ocean only to being a intercoupled, um, really um, complicated mesh of all the different characteristics of the Earth system. So you know this is kind of where we are now. Uh, impacts obviously is the topic of this, and in fact they they look and coordinate with the satellite mission, one of our flagship missions that's up right now is the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, um, and these all help us understand and define and and characterize our future observing systems as well so so what's under development now is um, the earth system observatory which is 
uh, basically going to be a constellation of satellites to really understand the Earth system as a whole. And, and really what, you know, these observations directly link to in a lot of ways is the, uh, the Atmospheric Observing System, AOS, is what it's being referred to, which is going to be a constellation of satellites um, with international partnership as well as NASA uh, to basically improve and, and better understand these, these processes from space. And with that, that's all I have. All right. Thanks, Will. Um, that concludes the presenter portion of um, our briefing. So next we're going to move to question and answer. Um, I'm going to put first, before I forget, the link to our uh, visual assets in the chat. Um, so those are available for download um, and, uh, and high resolution, uh, sorry, photos and video B-roll. All right, um, let me go to uh, the, attendees. So again, we are going to do a Q&A by, if you would like to speak your question out loud, ask it out loud. Um, you can, yes, put your hand up um, and I will call on you. And then we will also move to, then to questions that are in the chat. If you would like to uh, type it into the chat, we'll be reading those uh, verbatim. I'm going to toss those to Elena Johnson, my colleague, because uh, she, <laughs> she can keep track of that a little bit better than I can. Um, so, all right, so let me refresh here. Um, so the floor is open for questions. All right, I see Nell Greenfield voice. Um, let me, oh, it jumped on me. Um, all right, you are unmuted. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks for having this briefing. I'm Nell Greenfield Boyce with NPR. I have a science question for Lynn and a flying question for Rod. So Lynn, you talked about the bands. Could Obviously we know the bands are there, right? So could you talk about what they physically are and what is the goal? Is the goal to sort of be able to predict them more in advance to give more warning or something like that? And also Rod, you talked a little bit about flying in a snowstorm, the fact that it's like, you know, you look out, it, it's white. <laughs> uh, but in between taking your breaks and drinking your coffee, like, what do you have to do to keep a plane flying in the snow? Like, is it dangerous? Does it get sluggish? Does it get iced up? So basically, I'm just trying to understand a little bit more about um, the the science of the bands and then also what it what it actually feels like to fly in this place that everybody's trying to avoid. Uh, thanks. I'll go first and try to remember your question. Um, so you're asking about uh, the snow bands. Um, yes, sometimes we see them there. Sometimes they're not there. And um, it's hard to understand why some storms form banded structures and others don't. Uh, traditionally, you, you identify them from um, radar reflectivity, and but we don't really understand what's giving them the bright signal that I showed you, the yellow uh, colors that were highlighted where it's uh, a bright reflectivity. So we, we're actually trying to understand the processes that make them. When when do they start? When do they form? How did it, why are some long and skinny? Why are sometimes you have multiple bands and other times other storms which produce just as much snow can be much more gentle and not really a band. It's broader region of snowfall. So we're trying to understand all those processes. In addition, having the coordination between the ER2 remote sensing instruments and the microphysics that, you know, in the P3, uh, that actually helps us with the remote sensing question. That's part of our goals, too. Uh, if you want to measure snowfall from space, we really actually need to know the character of the snow crystals and the snow characteristics, how much water, how much total water, how much total ice, how much total liquid water. So um, we, we don't know if that bright reflectivity is because there's a lot of super cool water in the clouds or there's a lot of crystals or uh, they're really big or they're really like hundreds of little ones. So we're trying to understand, you know, what are the processes that are contributing to these, the banded structures and why some storms have, have a lot, have, you know, multiple banded structures and others have none. So we're trying to get the whole range. And I'll let Rod talk about flying in snowstorms because it's a lot of fun and pretty ex interesting. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, what's it like to fly in it? Um, well, so 
I think I tried to capture a couple of what you had asked. First off, um, does it change the flight characteristics? It certainly can. Ideally, it doesn't. Uh, you know, most large aircraft like we have uh, have very robust anti-icing and de-icing capability systems. Uh, we have systems that we can clear our wings off. We have, uh, in this case, it's a poor uh, engine prop airplane. We have systems that will protect the inlet structures to the engines, uh, the blades, uh, the, as you can see here on our plane, the uh, horizontal and vertical stabilizer. Each of those provide a, a system to take care of the icing on that. Uh, but ultimately, aircraft are designed with these systems in mind uh, to get out of it, not to stay in it. Um, that said, of course, science wants us to stay in it. So uh, to, to kind of answer your one question about uh, does it get sluggish, the plane itself doesn't really fly differently through uh, these different uh, ice or snow structures or, or, or rain for that matter. Uh, but what does happen is as it accumulates on the aircraft, we have to run the systems more often. There are points at which uh, the ice uh, can accumulate faster than the system can take it on. Uh, whether you have what they call light, we refer to it as light icing or light rime, light moderate, uh, mo or, uh, clear icing, moderate or heavy or severe. Um, most systems on, on large aircraft like this are designed to, to handle usually heavy uh, type uh, icing and de-icing capabilities, not so much severe. Uh, but what we have to do is as a crew, and we usually fly with six air crew on board and anywhere from eight to could be upwards of 18 scientists, I suppose, uh, depending on the mission. Uh, not necessarily this one, but I think we've carried at least 12 or uh, it looks like, yeah, 12 or 13 at, at a time on this one. Um, so we keep an eye on it. All the different crew uh, are trained to take a look at different pieces of the aircraft and then run the systems uh, as necessary to, to shed the ice, so to speak, or uh, the, the precipitation in that case. So it is our job really to ultimately uh, start the mission, end the mission as safely as we can and to allow them to get their science to the point at which we may have to call lock it off and, and, and maybe get above it or below it, depending on the temperatures, whether we can get out of it or get below enough uh, that, it, that it's no longer icing. So. It's definitely something that we keep a detailed eye on, um, but the system is very robust. It's very safe, and, uh, and, and you know, have we had to call it off a couple of times? Absolutely, uh, but that's that's where all of us as professionals talk amongst ourselves and come up to a collective decision on what the right thing to do is at the time. Uh, not sure if I answered all your questions, but uh, staying by if you have some more. Okay. Thanks. I'm going to Tony Rice next. Thanks for having this briefing. Uh, Tony Rice with WRL TV in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, question for Coach, our ER2 pilot. Um, we've been watching your, your beautiful skinny white airplane uh, through our skies over the last couple of weeks. And I had a question about the selection of Pope Army Air Force Base here in Fayetteville, North Carolina for your, your operations. You know, number one, it's pretty far south of where you've been collecting your science data. So I was curious why that was selected, and I wondered if the uh, airfield there itself offered any advantages, either with a chase plane or perhaps crosswinds or whatever. And a wider question that perhaps you can address, and I'm sure others on the panel can address too, uh, about how these sorties are selected, how these missions are selected, how far in advance and you're dealing with very dynamic weather patterns. Uh, how do you go about with the mission planning? Field selection for the ER2. So we knew we were going to be flying on days when the uh, northeast was going to be attacked by these snowstorms because that's that's our job is to be out there doing that. And uh, but the ER2, unlike the P3, does not have a robust anti-I system on board. In fact, we don't really have anything. So our uh, luckily we can climb through and descend fairly rapidly through most weather. But what what we didn't want to do is be impacted by the storms. Um, so we wanted to choose a base far enough away, far enough south that when the bad snowstorms hit the northeast, we wouldn't be affected locally at the airfield, um, but but still close enough that we could get there. So when we're based in Palmdale, which is Southern California, so that, that would be a uh, four hour flight to get to the northeast. So that's a little too far. So we wanted to be, you know, maybe an hour, hour and a half, um, two hours at the most 
from the area of interest. And so that's why we chose Pope Air Force Base. The other requirement that we uh, is almost a non-negotiable requirement is we need to be in a hangar because uh, as you can see, the airplane behind me right now is, is opened up. The nose isn't attached right now. The pods are uh, open and inside of the uh, aircraft in the nose and in those pods is where all those sensitive instruments are that we're using. And they don't like to get wet electronics. They don't like to get wet. So keeping, they need to work on them constantly. And so we need to be under shelter to get, to make that happen. So that was our two big things is reasonably close to the area of interest, a, a good runway, which Hope Army Airfield certainly has and a hangar. And so we hit them all there. Yeah. I can address your was, question. Well, the other oh, question is yeah, how, the how we yeah, choose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> that's my daily life here. So um, we have daily briefings every day. Uh, we have uh, forecast uh, our own forecaster students, mostly in postdocs that give us the outlook. We look out out to five days. And uh, as Rod has sit in, sit in on a much, many of our and, and coach has too, many of our briefings, we agonize over these, what is the forecast? So we actually have to have a good idea 72 hours in advance that we might fly. Uh, so uh, what we're, uh, for example, today, um, it, this is actually one of the most uncertain forecasts that we're trying to potentially fly in over the weekend, maybe Sunday, maybe Monday. Uh, we don't even know the time frame, but we still gave our uh, flight planner um, uh, person uh, a, a box of we might fly somewhere in this box and the takeoff could be anywhere between 10 UTC and 18 UTC. I hope it's good enough for you to work with. And then uh, 48 hours in advance, we really start narrowing it down. So uh, what we are depend on, we look at every forecast model we get our hands on. We look at the variance in that. Some will have the storm really strong, a lot of snow over New York. Another one will have it you know, at wallops here, then we have to think about, you know, is it gonna snow at wallops? Do we have to move the plane? Uh, so it's a very detailed agonizing process. And hopefully by 24 hours, we have a good chance, a good idea. And we uh, generally fly uh, patterns where we go across where we anticipate where bands are. So we're trying to go perpendicular to them on a warm side to the cold side. Um, ideally, we just pick one line and go back and forth and back and forth. Uh, ER2 just keeps doing lines up here. And the ER2 each time does a line, it does it at a different altitude. So we get the variance of the depth of the of the clouds. We know what's going on near the top, what's in the middle, what's near the bottom. We don't usually go too far low because of restrictions. Um, sometimes the, the storm kind of dries out underneath us and we have to ah, move the line a little farther. Oh, we got to move it again. Um, this year we've flown, um, let's see, a whole variety of places off of Massachusetts, off of Maine, over New York, uh, into Canada. We flew over Indiana and Ohio. Um, where else have I gone? I, I, I think that kind of covers it, but mostly we're kind of mostly focused on New England and New York because that's where it usually is snowing, but we go where the storms are. So we will go to the Midwest sometimes. Um, uh, last year, last time we flew in Illinois, uh, which was kind of the farthest we've gone, I think. But it is a long process and uh, I have a team of mission scientists. Uh, my uh, members of my science team rotate in. I'm here the whole time kind of overseeing it and making sure that I keep them honest and like don't, don't you know, that's unsafe, don't do that. Um, uh, and um, yeah, it's a it's a long process, but we meet every day, sometimes twice a day to come up with those things. And by 24 hours, we have a pretty good idea. And the day of flight, we still adjust. We adjust in the air. We are changing those lines as we see what we're measuring. And if we kind of missed it because the forecast was off, we'll just move it over a bit. Hope that helps you out. Thanks. All right, I don't see any other hands raised at the moment. So, Elena, I'm going to go to you. Do we have questions in the chat? You have questions in the chat. Um, Sophie from Chicago now with a question for Lynn. How do you determine which flight pattern to fly for each storm? So the flight pattern for each storm kind of depends on the storm. Um, we, we have a uh, idea, we look to see where the forecast for actual snowfall on the ground is and what the forecast is for the precipitation distribution and use that as our guidelines. And as I said, um, you know, to answer the other question, we um, 
we tend to fly up it, it, usually the it, we anticipate bands to be kind of linear and we fly across them so um we don't have very fancy uh multiple different flight plans uh, uh when we first started this we kind of developed um other ideas of how we would fly and then we kind of abandoned them because they got to be too complicated for coordination between the two aircraft um so if we ever fly over water enough we may someday uh, i'll just tell rod now we might do a spy roll <laughs> where which gives us kind of a vertical profile of the uh, microphysics uh, that is a very useful thing for us to do but generally speaking we start fly in straight lines across where we see the precipitation and we change them in real time as needed when we finally um, finally get up there and know what's going on. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to another question in the chat. How long are these flights typically? What is the timeline of the impacts project? Oh, lost my place here. Well, we tend to have eight hour flights total. Um, sometimes shorter, uh, but the maximum is uh, eight hours total. That includes ferry time. And uh, impacts is a five year project. First year was planning, three years of um, operations. So we've done in 2020, we were here in the winter. We skipped last year because uh, of COVID, and now we're here again. This is our second sortie, and we'll have another one next winter. Can't remember if there's other questions. <laughs> yep, you got it. Thank you. Another question from Sophie from Chicago now. What are the main differences between East Coast and Midwest snowstorms? And will any or of what you learn apply to forecasting here in the Midwest? Uh, I think they, yes, they would apply to the Midwest. Um, that's a good question and i don't know if i have the answer yet that's what we're probably going to look at <laughs> when we study the data i suspect uh fundamentally they're not different but you have um on the east coast you it's it, you have a moisture source right off your shore like we have the atlantic so they have uh there could be different characteristics because of that and the uh, chicago storms may have a drier uh, you can still have a lot of snowfall, but it may be a drier atmosphere, but I'm kind of guessing here. Um, so uh, I think the, the moisture moisture sources are different uh, between the two different regions. Um, and the stage of the storm itself, like whether it's a, a low pressure center that's deepening with time or filling with time. The, the, the big East Coast storms are all deepening rapidly with time, and that doesn't usually happen around Chicago, but it can. So. Um, I don't fully know the answer. Here's me guessing and thinking out loud, but uh, it, I, I do know the things that we learn in one location can and do apply in others, especially the relationship between the radar reflectivity from the remote sensing instruments and the microphysics that we're measuring. That will apply worldwide. Thank you, Lynn. A question from Alan Cochran. Have the flights come this far north to New Brunswick and Nova Scotia? where we get lots of snow. And for Lynn, last weekend, we had a storm that brought 57 centimeters of snow to my city of Moncton, but less than half that in cities 200 kilometers away. Will this research help predict how much will come? Uh, I gotta get a map to see how far north New Brunswick, how far did we go uh, last, um, last flight, Rod? Did we go that far we north? Went up by uh, Yarmouth. Uh, just northeast of Maine, we were talking actually to Moncton uh, air traffic control, but I don't know if we were actually flying over that geolocation, but definitely yeah. as far as uh, Yarmouth anyway. Yeah, I think um, where you're talking, I, again, I have to look at a map and look at where Pope is and, and how much time we could have for measurements, because uh, that's pretty far for, a, you know, we have to first get there and then do our measurements and then have enough time to come back. If it's if we have less than um, three and a half, four hours on station, it's like almost not worth all the effort to go. So um, we have gone in around Montreal. That's fairly easy for us to get to, especially from Pope and, and Wallops. So we do get into Canada, but that's also east. 
So, and your question about having a snowfall really intense in one location and less in the other, that's kind of the snow band idea. Like perhaps a snow band was, uh, was anchored over you and not over the other place or dry air came and evap, you know, took, you know, and sublimated all the, the snowfall in the air there. So I am hoping, yes, it would apply to your region too. I just don't know if we would get that far up there and generally probably not. Thanks, Lynn. We have another question for you. Can you talk more about the microphysics, the different types of snowflakes, the conditions they form in, and have you learned anything new in recent missions? Also, have you conducted any missions in the Midwest this season? I'll do it backwards. Yes, we've been in the Midwest this season, and the season before we went at least twice. Um, how do the microphysics? So there is a lot known about the processes that make snow. Uh, the different shapes happen at, at a variety of temperatures and humidities. So, and there's a lot known about that, a lot, a large body of literature. So we have expectations. And then what gets interesting is when we fly and we see a, a shape of a snowflake and like, gosh, you know, the temperature we have outside doesn't match where this snowflake would normally have formed. So it must have fallen from somewhere else or something lofted it up there. So uh, vertical motions are, are distributing the snowfall from where it formed to where we're measuring it. So um, there's always puzzles. Uh, some storms have a lot of liquid, wa super cool li liquid water in them. And that always surprises me whenever I say like, what's that doing there? <laughs> it's the temperature's minus 16. We have drops outside and no snow crystals are all super cool water. So that's kind of the, uh, some of the new things that we're um, getting. So um, I kind of forgot some of the other questions that were in that string. Anything else I forgot to answer? That's okay, Lynn. Thank okay. you. I'm to move on to some questions from social media. We have a question from Twitter. What do you personally think is missing with all weather radar detection systems? It's an infant field and right now we still struggle to forecast with highest accuracy. What do you think the missing link truly is? Because there definitely is one. I'm sure it's not one link. <laughs> I'm sure there's multiple things that are missing. Uh, what is missing and what we're trying to address here is relationships from what is actually in the sky and what the radar reflectivity is. So that's what we're trying to con uh, connect together. And once we understand that, then we can understand how to interpret our radar reflectivity better. So um, I agree that there's... Uh, Forecasting accuracy is, is, is very difficult. Um, Will talked about this earlier that one of the things where there are assumptions in numerical models about how, um, how snowflakes are formed and how much is you know, condensed and falls out. That's called uh, microphysics schemes inside those models. And our data will help address that, those problems, because there are some major problems with that. So that's the forecasting end. And the radar interpretation is actually measurement of the character of the snow crystals and the environment, the relative humidity, the amount of liquid water available, et cetera, will also help us interpret uh, the uh, radar, um, radar returns that we're getting. Thanks, Lynn. One more question from Twitter. Why are you using the U-2 as a platform when more recent and reliable aircraft are available? This might be a question for coach if you want to go for it. It is kind of a unique aircraft in the world. I don't know of any other aircraft that has the capability to take 5,000 pounds of uh, mission equipment and get it up to 65,000 feet and then hold it there all day long. So the NASA does have a similar aircraft called the WB-57, but it flies about 10,000 feet lower than us. Um, and it carries a similar payload, maybe slightly more, but not a whole lot. So it's the performance of the aircraft that is really pretty unique. It gets us up to altitude and carries a good payload and then keeps the sensors happy. That's the other piece of it, I suppose. You got to feed them with the proper uh, amounts of uh, power, electrical power that they need to operate and keep them pressurized and heated so that they don't uh, malfunction from the cold and the lack of pressure. So. Should answer it, I hope. 
I'll just say from a scientist, we love the ER2. We think that we get the best results from them. <laughs> I don't want any other aircraft. <laughs> oh, plus thank you, you have, <laughs> yeah, plus, plus you have a long distance. I think the W, w whatever it was called, can't go as long. Is that correct? That is true also, yeah. 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 So we're flying eight-hour missions here. Uh, we don't like to tell Lynn too much, but we could probably go 10. But, but the pilot would wear out. <laughs> when I was in the Air Force, we flew 12-hour missions with this airplane, and we still weren't out of gas. So the the legs are there, that's for sure. Um, in in my opinion, the the pilots that NASA hires me are a little bit older, and so we we uh, max out at about eight. <laughs> All right. Um, going back to hands briefly, uh, there was one, but it dropped. Um, so if there's no hands that appear in the next thirty seconds, we'll go back to Elena on the chat. Oh, there it is. Um, no. Oh, hey, this is Nell again. So sorry to dwell on the band so much, but it seems like that's a real focus of this study. I'm just curious, like how long have people been seeing these higher, these bands of higher reflectivity? Um, you know, have, have people been looking at this for decades and are they always associated with more snowfall or not? I guess I just am really surprised. It sounds like one of the points of impacts is even to understand like what these bands are and i'm just wondering like how long people have been looking at them and you know to what extent we know whether they actually are correlated with higher snowfall great questions i could send you all kinds of literature and you'll then you'll like glaze over but <laughs> i'd say for uh, some of the seminal papers on snow band structures were uh, early 2000s um the head of WPC of, of, and of uh, Weather Prediction Center of the National Weather Service, Dave Novak, uh, he did his thesis work on that. Uh, he's actually one of our uh, team members. Um, so, but that was a modeling-based study and uh, the radars that we had then were uh, not as sensitive as what we have on the ER2 right now. So uh, we're, we're able to now, what we couldn't do then is uh, study the, uh, the variability of snow band structures. The idea of um, rainfall or snowfall being uneven actually has been around for quite a while. So rain bands uh, were studied back at University of Washington uh, off of the off of Washington coast. That's back in the 70s and 80s. So we do we've known quite a long time that the structures exist, but the um, explanation of why is what we're still missing. And um, we haven't, you know, we've known these things are there, but when you use just ground-based radar, you don't have a lot of um, uh, resolution in the vertical. So the pictures that both Will and I showed when you look down from these ER2 uh, radars, you get really detailed vertical structure that, so um, sometimes you can get fooled looking at a, um, a ground-based radar uh, if it's actually uh, a situation where it's snow aloft and maybe it goes through a period of melting, that's called the bright band. And you think, oh, that's that's my snow band. But no, that's actually the signature of melting. And it's no more water or less water than, uh, than outside of that region. So um, it, it, yes, we've known about this structure, these structures for a while, but uh, making these kind, we've never had measurements like this for over 30 years. Uh, 30 years ago or more were, was the last time we did kind of any kind of flights over the uh, northeast, you know, the, along the east coast of these uh, snowstorms. And, and the technology has completely changed, you know, forecasting ability has completely changed. And um, so we have pretty state-of-the-art instrumentation to, to uh, throw at this problem and understand it a lot better than we had already in the past. I hope that helps. Thank you, Thank Lynn. You. I'm going to move on to one last question from the chat. And this one, I'm just going to jump in. We are at 11.59, so we need to make it super brief. Um, and I put in the chat, we will email Lena questions and we will get you follow-ups um, as well. Yes, thank you, Ellen. So Tony from WRAL, follow-up question. It sounds like the flight, flight plans are pretty dynamic. How is other air traffic handled, particularly with the P3 at a lower altitude? or are you flying in the areas that other pilots are already avoiding? That's for you, Rod. 
like that one. <laughs> the, the answer is yes to all the above, really. Uh, we are flying in areas that they aren't, but uh, I, I can't um, applaud the air traffic controllers from Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Maine, uh, everywhere. They have really gone above and beyond and out of their way to help coordinate. Uh, it's, you know, our, our call signs are NASA something in numbers. Uh, and they hear that, they know that, they want to know what it is we're doing, why we're there, and they really go above and beyond and out of their way to help coordinate that traffic and to allow us to run those patterns. But it also is typically in the areas that uh, others are not trying to do. But uh, this this has actually taken coordination over years with those air traffic controls that Lynn and her team has been working with. And then we have an on-the-ground team that at those 72, 48, and 24-hour points that she addressed earlier, that we're also making the phone calls. And, and honestly, I, I did want to throw out a, a, to Canada as well. Uh, all of them have been extremely uh, accommodating uh, to help do that. All right, thank you. Um, thank you all for attending. This concludes our media briefing. Um, as I mentioned a minute ago, if you have follow-up questions, um, please do email Elena. She will uh, get them to the right people and we can also schedule follow-up interviews if you would like to do that. Um, all right, with that, I will be closing out the meeting um, very shortly. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.